It's been a long sermon series. But it's been a blessing, I hope, to you. And, uh, as we finish off this chapter this morning, we'll read through some things. And I want to call your attention to something this morning. Open it up a little bit and let's turn to Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 3. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. I want you to understand this morning that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was not found. Verse 6, it says, He is not here, but is risen. What was risen? His body was risen. Remember how He spake unto you when He was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. What was crucified? His body. And the third day rise again. What rose again? His body. And when they found not His what? If they didn't find His body, it meant His body was what? Was risen. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that He was alive. Then He said unto them, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? What entered into His glory? His body. The whole Jesus. Verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. Verse 36, As they thus spake, Jesus himself stood. What did he stand in? His body. In the midst of them. And said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted. Why? Because they supposed that they had seen a spirit. Did they see only a spirit? They supposed that they had saw a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. What resurrected? The body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you here any meat? Oh, he's really going to get this thing proven, isn't he? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. So you got your protein and your carb there. That's so healthy, isn't it? And he took it. It was organic. It's awesome. And he took it and did eat before them. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his what? His hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. What was carried up into heaven? The body of the Lord Jesus Christ. My sermon this morning is Christ is not a Gnostic ghost. That's very important for you to understand that this morning. People are talking about the resurrection. I want you to understand what resurrected. My Lord's body resurrected. And the Lord is not a ghost. It was His body that resurrected. And I tell you what, that's going to mean something to you today. Because it's going to mean that when you get resurrected, it's not just your spirit that's resurrecting, your body will resurrect. And the same Lord that resurrected will also come again in His body. And we need to know that today. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray. As always, Father, You give us order in the house of God that the Word of God may be preached and understood this morning. We pray, Father, for spiritual blessings upon the truth this morning, God. Keep me from error, God. Bless us in all that we do here today. Bless our fellowship, our lunch together, Lord, our testimony service. Lord, thank You for Your goodness. Thank You for the salvation that is in the blood of Jesus, Lord. Amen. Let me show you another verse. Look at John chapter 2. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? 
Verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his what? Okay, so the Lord said, I will raise up my what? My body. And he certainly did that and proved it to the witnesses that were there. Verse 22, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. I don't know how you can be a Bible believer. I don't know how you can call yourself a Christian and not believe that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead. In 1 John, John tells us that which from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and don't miss this now, and our hands have handled, was Jesus a ghost? No, He touched the Lord of the Word of life. Jesus was not just a Christ spirit before His resurrection or after His resurrection. The Son of God was born of a virgin, made flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, says the Bible. And before the resurrection and after the resurrection, the disciples handled Jesus and touched Him and proved He was not a phantom. He was not a spirit. He was not a ghost. He was the risen, resurrected Lord. Why is this important? Well, because when the Bible says something, it means it and we ought to believe it. The idea that you have the right to judge the Bible is preposterous. But there was a new cult that arose in the early days of Christianity called the Gnostics. And they claimed they had secret wisdom. The Bible predicted in the last days that this Gnosticism would be throughout all the world and a new Christianity would arise based not upon the Scriptures, but upon this Gnosticism. So now there is a movement to go back to the not true Bible text, not the, the Word of God that's inspired, but to go to this cult writing, the, the, these Gnostics that were uh, always the fringe of the Christian movement, and of uh, these Gnostic New Agers, you'll see them being revived today in the Da Vinci Code, uh, in, in theosophy, in various movements where they go back to so-called lost manuscripts of the Bible. And these were Gnostic manuscripts that did not believe in a resurrected Jesus. And... Uh, we see how today this is being revived. These Gnostics says that they are so much wiser than the average Christian. They know how to interpret the Bible spiritually and find the secret spiritual wisdom, thus Gnostic knowledge, this occult knowledge that they supposedly have. What they say is that the real Jesus did not die upon a cross. That was only the material Jesus, but that the Christ Spirit somehow or another left Jesus as he died on the cross. And that the important thing is spirit and not body. Now, you could go too far with that, you understand? You could get so far away, and this is what the Gnostics did, they got so far away from the body that they began to teach it doesn't matter what you do in the physical body. Your body's going to die and turn to dust, so it doesn't matter if you commit bestiality, it doesn't matter if you fornicate, it doesn't matter, eat whatever you want, abuse your body in whatever fashion, because since it's dust and it's going to die, the body is not important. You see how that is a false idea. I need you to understand that Jesus Christ resurrected, and the Bible says He's the first fruits of the dead. Now, if He's the first fruits of the dead, then there must be a harvest, right? You have a first fruit and you have a harvest. Now, if Jesus did not resurrect literally in His body, what does that mean in regard to the whole harvest? It means your body will not resurrect, according to these Gnostics. And with that assumption comes the idea that my body doesn't matter and what I do in my body uh, is not important. It's just a worthless, dead matter and I have no responsibility whatsoever to possess my body in honor. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4 in your notes. God says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. What's your vessel? Your body. In sanctification and honor. That means your body is to be conducted. Your vessel is to be conducted in sanctification and honor. It's very important, isn't it? Romans 1 says, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. A lot of people dishonoring their bodies today. 2 Corinthians 7 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, 
Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, not only of the spirit, but of the flesh and spirit, the inside and the outside, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We have an imbalance today that's come from this Gnostic philosophy. And this Gnostic philosophy is teaching, and it's trickling down throughout the world, through the media, through Hollywood, and this, and through the colleges. This teaching is simply this. Outward holiness does not matter. What you're doing outwardly does not matter. All that matters is the spirit. Practical godliness is despised. Outward holiness is omitted. And what you are left with is a mystical inward spirituality where people say, I'm holy because I feel holy. I'm holy because I have holy, fuzzy feelings. And as long as I have holy, fuzzy feelings, I'm holy. And it doesn't matter what I do with my body. It doesn't matter what I'm doing outwardly. And I'm going to tell you, this was the same type of cult teaching that was being manifested in the Roman Empire in the early days. And the apostles began to write against it. They said in 1 John 3, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteous righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. In other words, if you want to be a good Christian, you must be an obedient Christian. And obedience includes not just inward fuzzy feelings or even inward motives. It includes the outward deed and to walk in holiness before God, just like with our children. I don't want my children to just say to me, well, Father, I have loving feelings toward you. I'm glad you have loving feelings toward me, but I want you to have loving actions toward me. I want you to walk in obedience, in deed and in truth. And if they say, well, it's all that matters is what I am in, inwardly, Daddy, I'll say, no, that, where's my spanky stick? That's not what matters inwardly. What matters is what you are inside and outside as you manifest your motives in practical deed. And it's so important that we understand that. Our chapter before us today totally refutes the idea that Jesus was a resurrected spirit. And I don't know how many times the Bible, the Holy Ghost, can make it clear to us that Jesus resurrected in his body. I want you to look now at modern Gnosticism. I don't have time to go through all the various manifestations, but I will give you three major manifestations of this idea of... In A, we have modernists, liberals. They are modern Gnostics. They do not believe in the literal resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then you have the theosophists and psychics of the 19th century and the 20th century. They also denied the resurrection of Christ. And then, of course, one you probably realize are the Russellites or the JWs who deny the resurrection of Christ. Let us first take a look at Harry Emerson Fosdick. He died in 1969. He was one of the first liberals, uh, one of the first modernists who came to teach that your Bible is not true. It doesn't matter. Uh, Preachers need to be replaced by psychologists, and we need a new religion of psychology instead of Christianity. Jesus was not born of a virgin. There is no second coming. Uh, And he began to call himself a Baptist pastor. And you say, well, why would anybody ever follow this person? Well, he had backing, financial backing. And any nut, anybody can be put in the foreground or or, or put in the public eye if they have financial backing. In 1925, Harry Emerson Fosdeck became the pastor of Park Avenue Baptist Church. John D. Rockefeller was the member of his church. Rockefeller built Fosdeck a cathedral in Upper Manhattan. It became the interdenominational Riverside Church. Harry Fosdeck was the brother of Raymond Fosdeck, who happened to be the president of the Rockefeller Foundation and Rockefeller's biographer. In 1919, Raymond Fosdeck sent a letter to his wife and told her that he was daily working to lay the framework of international government. So the Fosdecks needed one important thing, to work with Rockefeller to bring this international League of Nations or New World Order. And one of the main things they needed was to redefine Christianity. If fundamental Christianity is prevalent in America, you can never have a world government. 
The reason being is you can never have a world church with fundamental Christians saying there's only one way to be saved. That's by the blood of Jesus. So therefore, fundamental Christianity is the enemy of the international movement to bring the whole world together under a global church. Therefore, what needs to be defined? Christianity and America must be redefined into this liberal idea that um, you have a Bible that is only to be interpreted spiritually and you cannot believe anything that it actually says. A great pastor, uh, Isaac Macy Haldeman, pastor of First Baptist of New York, he was one of the fundamentalists that tried to resist what was coming out of Fosdick's writings. So he wrote a review in 1925 called Dr. Harry Emerson's Fosdeck, a book, The Modern Use of the Bible. That was the book that Fosdeck wrote. And Haldeman gave a review in 1925. And here's what Haldeman said. Since Dr. Fosdeck does not believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ, he has nothing more to say about it than that it puzzles him. He says, quote, We may not know what to make of narratives about his eating fish after his resurrection. I know what to make of it. Do you have any problem knowing what to make of it? But it puzzles him, doesn't it? Fosdek then deduces the possibility of a psychic resurrection. This is what happens, people. Every time you get far away from the Bible and say, I'm a realist, I'm a rationalist, you end up with a Ouija board, see? That happened to Charles Potter and, and many of these others. All he really knows, according to his own testimony, is that Christ's body of flesh never rose from the dead. It corrupted and turned to dust. Do you believe that? The Christ he portrays is only a fragmentary Christ, a bodiless Christ, a ghost Christ, not the Christ of victory over death and the grave. I believe Jesus got victory over death and the grave. And I believe that's my hope. As my dead relatives are being buried, my hope is if they believed in the Lord Jesus, that body is going to be resurrected. You say, well, how could God do such a thing? How can God be eternal? How could God be omnipotent? How can God be born of a virgin? How could God do many of the things? God's able to bring your cells, every one of them, back together. If the hairs of your head are numbered, then He has the cells of your body, and He knows how many of them it takes to be your body, and He's going to bring them back and have your body resurrected. I believe it. There's some others that follow this liberalism even today. The present Pope, believe it or not, does not believe in the resurrection of Christ. In his introduction to Christianity, 2004, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, right now called Pope Benedict XVI, says it, has, it now becomes clear that the real heart of faith in the resurrection does not consist at all in the idea of the restoration of bodies to which we have been reduced in our thinking. Such is the case even though this is the pictorial image used throughout the Bible. So what is the Pope saying? The Pope is an evolutionist, by the way, who believes in evolution, and he also believes that fundamental Christianity is the most dangerous thing on earth today. And he believes that when you read the Bible, the resurrection is only a picture. The body of Jesus never really arose. So what do we have in the world today? We have the new Gnosticism that the early Christians fought against so valiantly, and today um, it has revived. Now let's go to some of the psychic Theosophists. Um, Johannes Grieber, who died in 1944, was a Roman Catholic priest who became interested in psychic communication with spirit beings. Him and his wife were mediums and would go into trances and try to get these spirits to uh, talk to them so they can have automatic writing. And he claims that his translation of the New Testament, the New Testament by Johannes Grieber, a medium of God's spirit world, he claims that he was able through psychic intervention to translate the New Testament. Well, he goes through, and, and in his New Testament, he denies that Jesus is divine. He denies the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And instead of saying Jesus was God, as it says in John 1, he put a God. Well, of course, the Watchtower, JWs, began to follow Grieber and use him as the authority for their own translation, the New World Translation of the Scriptures. And... Uh, then they found out that this guy was a psychic and was a medium, and so now they're scratching their head wondering how we're going to get out of this, that we've used him to justify our translation, and now uh, he's this medium. And the truth of the matter is, is they knew he was a medium to begin with. They just figured it was through God's Spirit that he translated the Bible. Let's see what Grieber has to say about what we read there in Luke 24. 
Reber says not even Christ's natural body was raised. The resurrection of the dead has therefore not the slightest reference to the resurrection of the physical body. So whatever spirits were in Johannes Grieber, they weren't very nice spirits, were they? Because you're not a very nice spirit if you call Jesus a liar. And if you call the Bible writers a liar. Let's go to the Watchtower organization. The Watchtower organization was founded by Charles Hayes Russell, who died in 1916. Russell says this in his book, Time is at Hand. Our Lord's human body was, however, supernaturally removed from the tomb. We know nothing about what became of it. Oh, yes? My Bible says what? It resurrected and entered into glory. Whether it was dissolved into gases or whether it is still preserved somewhere as the grand memorial, no one knows. So you have a body of Jesus entombed, I guess with the eyes open, sitting there like in wax, uh, entombed somewhere so you could go by and see it one day. And this belief of Russell is reflected in their translation that says in Luke 24, they found the stone rolled away from the memorial tomb. See, the body is just a memorial. And um, Russell predicted that Jesus would return to this earth in 1874. When this did not occur, in 1877, he argued that Jesus did return, but he returned invisibly. The Adventists did that in 1843 when the Lord did not return, when William Miller thought that he was going to return based upon his false view of the Bible. Then Miller finally repented and says, I shouldn't have set a date for the Lord's return. But the Seventh-day Adventist cult and Ellen G. White, who called herself a prophetess, said, no, the Lord did return, but he returned invisibly. Well, Charles Taze Russell was associated with the Adventists, so he learned that trick through them. So he said, Jesus did return in 1874. You just couldn't see him. Well, we already know that would make sense according to Russell's theology because Russell did not believe in the resurrection of the Lord. Jesus is just a ghost. So therefore, if Jesus is going to return, what do you have? You have a ghost return. Notice Zion Watchtower in 1881. Russell's organization tells us Jesus was due here in the fall of 1874. Can it be possible that Jesus does not come in a fleshly body at his second advent? No. But he believes yes. The fire supposed to be literal was really symbolic. So when the Lord comes to judge the world, it's spiritual judgment too. The angel's message in Acts 1 that says this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven, this had generally been supposed to teach that Jesus would come in the flesh. But the angel's language seemed peculiar. This same Jesus, as though there had been another Jesus. Examination revealed the fact that Jesus, since his resurrection, is a totally different being from the Jesus who died. He is no longer a natural but a spiritual body. So they began to say there are two Jesuses. The dead Jesus that is laying enshrined somewhere in a tomb, in wax, I guess, and that Jesus, and then another Jesus that is the ghost Jesus that walks around. So he says in 1874, the ghost Jesus came to this earth. Do you believe that? A few months later in 1881, they wrote, when 1874 came and there was no outward sign of Jesus in the literal clouds and in fleshly form, it was soon discovered that the expectation of Jesus in the flesh at the second advent was a mistake. The human nature of Jesus remains a sacrifice forever. That means it's over there as the sacrifice entombed somewhere. The bridegroom came in the autumn of 1874. And then he has the audacity to end it with how firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. He has a ghost foundation, doesn't he? He has a Gnostic. I don't call that a firm foundation because it means your Bible is wrong. And it means that uh, God, who said the Lord's body would not turn to corruption, lies. They began to teach that since Jesus came invisibly in 1874, you would have about 40 years 
until the end of the world and Armageddon finally finished up everything. So he says, even though you can't see Jesus, he's going to be judging the world. So pretty soon in 1914, it's all over and Armageddon is finished. It says um, in Watchtower 1892, the date of the close of that battle is definitely marked in Scripture as October 1914. It is already in progress. It's beginning dating from October 1874. So he said Jesus came in 1874 and there's going to be this tribulation period until it ends in 1914 with the destruction of the world. Well, 1914 came and World War broke out. And they all laughed and got a big smile and said, oh yeah, here it is, just like we said. And everybody kind of dropped their lips and scratched their chin and says, uh, wow, this is pretty interesting. But of course, the world didn't end in 1914. It was a false prophecy. So what did they do in 1914 and after? They said, uh, we never said that was the end. We said that was the beginning. So Judge Rutherford in Reconciliation in 1928 says the physical facts show that God's due time arrived in 1914. That was the legal end of Satan's world. The coming of the Lord to his temple occurred in the year 1918. So the Lord keeps coming, but he never gets here. It is therefore not the duty of the Christian on earth to convert the world nor to save souls to God. Interesting. So once 1914 came, they said, well, it's not going to end in 1914. That's when it all began. Something happened in 1914, you know. Um, Jesus did something up in the invisible heavens in 1914. But uh, don't worry, 1914 marks the date. The date for what? Well, they tell us in the little book, You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth, they say, which generation did Jesus mean when he says a generation shall not pass away who sees all these things? He meant the generation living in 1914. These persons yet remaining of that generation are now very old. However, some of them will still be alive to see the end of this wicked system. They're 93 today. There's not many of them left. So of this we can be certain. Shortly now there will be a sudden end to all wickedness and wicked people at Armageddon. Since Christ returned and sat down on His heavenly throne, all humankind has been on judgment. In 1984, as late as 1984, they said, Yes, you may live to see this promised new order along with survivors of the generation of 1914, the generation that will not pass away. As late as 1995, they said, This magazine builds confidence in the Creator's promise of a peaceful and secure new world before the generation that saw the events of 1914 passes away. A few months after 1995, they began to change their literature all so subtly and begin to act as if they never said anything like this at all. Because you only have a few left. See, they're 93. They're getting older and older. So, the world is watching, and many Christians are watching, to see how the JWs are going to handle this when we keep getting older and older, and pretty soon the generation in 1914 passes away. But, of course, they will do what they've always done. Whenever they get what they say, and, and, and look, There are good Christians that make mistakes. This is different. Because, number one, they don't believe the fundamentals of Christianity. Number two, this isn't just a good Christian making a mistake. If I ever said to this church, when I get behind this pulpit, I am infallible. And I am speaking by the Spirit. And I am absolutely inspired when I'm behind this pulpit. If I ever say that, then I'll be saying what the Pope teaches. I'll be saying what the JWs teach. Because they say when they hand out their magazines, those writings are inspired. But what they do is when they're guilty of false prophecy and you go back and study their magazines and say, if you're inspired, then why are you making false predictions? They say, we never said that. Those were some of the people among us that said those things. Those are the JWs among us. Good people they were that said those things. But, you know, you can't believe everything a witness tells you. And, of course, that's ridiculous. This is very important for us to see. Your theology will determine the way you think and how you live. At the bottom of most of what you think and do 
lies your view of God. If you have the wrong view of the resurrection of Christ, if you have the wrong view of the Bible, it will affect how you make moral decisions today. It will also affect how you view the resurrection. If you do not believe Jesus resurrected in the body, you have no ground for believing you will resurrect in the body. And then that begins to have consequences. If you don't believe you'll resurrect in the body, it's an easy step to what does it really matter? I'll never see this body again. I'll never stand before God and be judged in this body. Who really cares about this body? Let's uh, party. Let's, let's do whatever we want to do and just live in pleasure and sin because my body doesn't matter. As long as I have good, pleasant thoughts, it doesn't matter what I do in my body. I can eat, kill myself, abuse my body, and it doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ, according to our Bible, it says the same manner that He left, so will He come again. He's coming in His body. And the Bible says you, every one of us, says the Bible in 2 Corinthians 5, shall stand before God to receive of the things done in His body. If you stand before God, according to the Bible, that means you resurrect out of the grave to stand before God. And what's God going to judge you on? It says to receive for the things done in your body. That's it. Why do we call Jesus Lord and disobey Him in our body? It's a good question, isn't it? Jesus asked that question. He says, why do you call me Lord and refuse to do the things that I say? He said, there's going to be a day at the judgment where many will stand before me and say, Lord, Lord. But he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. If Jesus is Lord, and we call him Lord, and we admit that he resurrected, and the Bible says all power has been given to Jesus. Jesus says, now that I've been resurrected, I am the judge of the earth. All power, all authority is in me. I will decide. Everything. And the Bible says before Jesus, every knee will bow. The knee of Hitler, the knee of Stalin, the knee of George Bush, the knee of Hillary Clinton, the knee of Michael Jackson, the knee of Oprah Winfrey. Every one of you will bow. I will bow. And every tongue, says the Bible, will confess that he's Lord. And if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're trusting in your own works, if you think, well, my good works are going to outweigh my bad works, and I believe I'm a good person, then your faith is in your own righteous deeds. And the Bible says, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. There's a new way. Jesus came to be your substitute and then die on a cross to be your sin bearer. That you might be saved. So you have two ways of salvation. Try to be as good as you can. Try to tell God you're sorry over and over. And just hope for the best. That's called Judaism. It's called walking in your own righteousness. It's called Phariseeism. Or you can say, I admit I'm a sinner, God. Have mercy upon me. I believe in the free grace and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I use the analogy quite often. It's like a little orphan that doesn't have a father. And some man comes to her, a good, godly, rich man, and he says unto her, I want you to come home with me and be my daughter. And she says, how many windows do I have to wash to be your daughter? I want to come because I don't like it here. Can I come and sweep the floor? And, and uh, how many times? And by the way, tell me the rules so I can never make sure that I end up not being your daughter anymore. And the man says, oh, no, you don't understand. It's by my grace and by my love that you're going to come be my daughter. And no other way. You can't pay for it. You can't earn it. You can't buy it.
Now, when you get home, there are rules. But rules are simply to keep you from being disciplined or so you can get reward and so we can have good fellowship between one another. Rules are not, Tabitha, if you don't obey the rules of my house, you will no longer be my daughter. That's insanity. And God doesn't work that way with us. So today, let's be excited about the free grace of Jesus. It's free. And once you become His child, He says, now obey me or I'm going to get the rod. But that's not what we're hearing today. We're hearing this new movement that denies the resurrection of our Lord, spiritualizes everything in the Bible, says you can't interpret the Bible literally. It makes a mess of our theology. And what did Jesus say to do if you're a Christian? You don't have a choice in the matter. He says, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm contending. Let us pray. Dear Holy God, I pray this morning that anyone in this church, anyone listening over the Internet, I pray right now, Lord, they'll get excited about believing God, about reading the Bible and a new thing, actually believing what's written therein. Oh, God, how it'll change our lives. Oh, Lord, you warned about those that are wiser in their own eyes who think they're wiser than God. Oh, Lord, let us not be foolish in that manner. God, I pray right now that every believer that's in this room or listening to this sermon will understand that you resurrected from the dead and, God, you give them resurrection power right now. Not fuzzy power, not mystical power, real power to fight real sin so they can be holy and righteous. And God, You don't leave us alone. Whatever battles we face, Father, whatever trials we go through, whatever sin we have to overcome, God, You're there with us. Let us believe in Your resurrection today, God. Let us not just say we believe it, but let us believe in it, Lord. Make us better Christians, Father. Oh, Lord, we fully believe and say, in the same way you went into heaven, surely you will come again, Lord. Even so, come, Lord Jesus Christ. The world needs you, Father. The world needs the Lord. We know there'll be no peace without you, Lord. Come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen.